Nobody doesn't switch back for some reason. He got pretty beat up. God, that's such a great shot. <laughs> it just captures the, the agony of... Oh my god, that was terrifying. The agony of waiting for him to show up. Yeah, we got a bigger problem though. Got some bad news for you. Oh, he's right there. Was that teleporting or was it super speed? Yeah. There's still a remote possibility that this is a, a plan. A strategy of some sort. Just had to show off, didn't you? <laughs> Joke's on you, I stabbed myself with my hand. Oh, but he can't. What in the world? How does he get out of this one? He's gonna eat it. Yeah, I was, I was wondering. So much for all at once and then killing him. I feel like we're gonna have a lot of these popping up wherever we find special grade curses. Quite the pickle. <laughs> that really raised the stakes by a lot. If you got a plan, <laughs> now would be a good time, maybe. This guy looks a lot like the demon in the Mugen Train arc, so I automatically hate him. Episode 5, Cursed Wu Must Die, Part 2. Yeah, hitting some familiar villain notes here. Life is cruel, therefore it's all about power. Victory? The amount of faith he has in him already. He's a lot tougher and denser than normal humans. This is sort of awesome. Even with his doubts, the fact that he just sprung into that plan like that. You got this moment in front of you though. There you go. He's got some protagonist DNA himself. He's got a whole zoo at his disposal. That kind of energy will never ever cease to get me on some level. Looking what seems to be an impossible challenge directly in the face and having the urge to flee but not giving yourself that option. I think I mentioned this before but there's a passage of Sun Tzu's Art of War that really stuck with me about how one way to weaken your enemy severely is to let them know that there's a way out, that they could flee. You know, always give them a back door because if their backs are against the wall, it's either fight or die, so they're gonna fight a lot harder than they would if they had that nagging thought in their head that they could escape at any moment. And I think one sign of a, a very strong will is to be the one to close that option yourself, to not feed the instinct to give up or to escape, but instead, no matter how difficult the challenge, to accept it. And he did it so quickly, you know, like, they did the setup so well. He's staring with a vague sense of hope, but perhaps a lot of dread as well at the path leading to where he hopes usually is, is taking care of things, but it's sort of unsettled doing so. And then next thing you know, he's fighting the greatest, most terrifying arch curse. And there's very good reason to believe that no one is coming to help. But this is one of those fights where you don't need to win necessarily. You need to stall and survive. It was never gonna go that way. Is he just too good? This is probably my favorite. This thing is awesome. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, we got a bird for that. We got a bird for that. We got a bird for that. Where's the bird? <laughs> oh, damn. Eh, a little late, but better late than never. So they can actually die if he doesn't call them back in time. What's he getting at? Definitely some backstory there. I'm guessing he suffered some injustice. Maybe his joining the Jujutsu Sorcerers is his way of balancing the scales a little bit, doing what he can. But even though I don't know the extent of it for his character, it's almost definitely going to be an incomplete scheme of the world. I'm going to guess as an extension of that that he has trouble putting his faith in other people or having faith that things will turn out well. Once you get burned in a big way from something that seems just random and cruel, it kind of shakes your faith in life. You know, it tunes you into the existence of sort of a hammer that could drop at any time, which to the individual will seem like an acceptance of reality. And in a large part it is because life is cruel and terrible things do happen randomly, but often that leads to an overcompensation in that direction where even some of the greater things are ignored because it's risky to believe in them. And flashback, here it is.
誰よりも幸せになるべき人だった。Here it is, the, the random cruelty and pain. 俺の性別も知らず、めぐみなんて名前をつけた父親は。Oh, he's the boy named Sue, Japanese edition. 悪人は法のもとで初めて裁かれる。呪術師はそんな報いの。Yeah, yeah, he does see himself as sort of recalibrating things. 不平等に人を助ける。It's just adding more curse. I mean, he's a fan, right? He's a fan of power. That's what's keeping him alive right now. Just instinct. Just instinct. I mean, if those are. <laughs> if that's selfishness. Go for it. That's a very heroic thing to say. Oh! He's in there somewhere. He's not going out like this. <laughs> so dramatic. How are we getting out of this? I still don't know. While on its face it feels like there's something cynical about his take, ultimately I like it because it puts the locus of action on himself. To say that unfairness is sort of the, the dictating principle that underlies all of human life is a bit much. I mean, just for argument's sake, you could take the opposite. Um, you could say that everything that happens is exactly as it should be and is therefore fair and can only be fair by definition. And there's an argument for that as well. There's some truth in there and the truth is probably in between. It depends on how you're defining fairness and I think that largely comes down to what your expectations are of life. Life, but life doesn't really care what your expectations are. It is the way it is. And randomness is often just the, the word or concept we ascribe to something when we don't understand it. But very few things, if anything, happens for no reason. There is a logical structure to existence. It's just that that doesn't always play out in the favor of, of mankind and definitely doesn't play out in favor of the individual and what the individual wants for life. So the truth is more complicated than just things are unfair. There are a lot of shades of gray in there to examine. Nevertheless, where he falls in his assessment is, all right, well, a lot of this is out of my control. I got this life. I'm going to follow my heart and my instincts and do whatever I can in whatever small way I can do it. And he's so confident in that and connected to that idea, then he can basically in a few instances decide to fight the most powerful curse that he's ever encountered and actually do pretty well, even though, you know, Sukuna was playing with him. So pretty cool. And they had to do it to me. They had to take me out of that moment that moment of suspense to show me whatever this is. <laughs> like in the... I'm liking the vibe of this squid dude. I like this whole thing. I'm guessing they don't actually look like this to most people. Oh, I see they only see him. But do they eat? And also, what the hell were they? <laughs> is that... I mean, he's coming back. He's coming back. Uh huh. Yeah, so it was a plot. It was intentional. Ooh, that's dark. What is with upper management? Oh, this casts a whole new light on this whole organization. That opens up some crazy doors. Now I'm thinking we're headed for something like Nerve and Evangelion, where your employers are, are not, well, they don't necessarily have your interests in mind. Do they even get paid for this? Maybe they get paid in seeds. Reagan style. Would that make her Ritsuko? He's coming back. He's not dead. <laughs> That's what she says on the outside. I suspect there's a lot more going on. And here come the waterworks. Right on cue. That was subtle, but pretty tactful. Turning to a mundane topic, giving her a little little space. I don't know. And a new character at a moment like this. Zenin. Senpai. <gasps> it's here! He's here. Wow. Panda Senpai. At last. Yeah, here we go. And he's got a kind heart. He's soft on the inside and the outside. Speech. Got it. That's a very interesting quirk. His name is Panda. He's a panda and his name is Panda. They just know what I want and they just give it right, right to me in panda form. <laughs> what more is needed? We're already there. We're all the way there. And it's great. 
I like how the show is just casually, lightheartedly carrying on with the main character dead. Oh, is it the tournament arc already? How do they decode what he. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, right into the tournament. What does his armband say? I love what? Don't question it. Don't question the tournament arc. It's important. Right, it's for depression and also character development. Curses can wait. I can't wait to see Panda fight. And he will live on in memory, I see, I guess. <laughs> he will just live on as inspiration and will never be seen again in, in flesh. I love Panda! It's Panda on top of Panda, and I love it. It's so self aware. I'm gonna stop you right there, Volcano Head. You might be able to say that emotions that are the strongest probably are also the ones that are the, the oldest because there's a very strong connection in humans between what is strong and what is old and tested by time and evolution. Breathing, for example, is so fundamental and so old that it's thoughtless. Anger probably served a really important survival function, and so it's deep, but you could say the same things about pleasurable emotions. But even then, just because something is older and more tested, more pure to use this random curse's words, doesn't mean that they're of higher value. I think he's just jealous. He's just jealous. He's the strongest. And he's not management, huh? This guy knows his stuff. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize it's him in the intro. This, in many ways, felt like the most packed episode so far. Just so much happened. We had the amazing last stand of sorts with Megumi, as he shall now be known. The subsequent death of the main character. Panda showing up. Highlight of the episode and the whole show, obviously. And then just smack in the middle of the, the chaos and Yuji's death. Tournament arc. If you can't tournament arc, can you even call yourself a shonen? Followed by what seems to be a villain introduction. Of the minor kind and the major kind. The fact that they're seeking this guy out and that he's so in the know means he's someone to face on the horizon. And then also just casually dropping the fact that management is not great. They're not the best. They don't have the kids' interests in mind, it seems. They're capable of really petty stuff, yet the the students are sort of stuck because where else do they go? That is a coexistence that seems like it cannot last. This might end up being one of those cases where we're not just fighting the, the curses, but we're fighting ourselves, which makes sense because at the end of the day, it's all it's all humanity. With, I feel like all that combined, it just stretched out the, the scope of the events that are going to play out by a lot in one swoop. And then also what I'm guessing will be some sort of character introspection and journey by you in this sort of dark world of his shared psyche with Sukuna. I feel like it's a missed opportunity not having Panda dancing. He does get to hold balloons though. This ending makes me want to dance and also go shopping. Juju Stroll! I'm waiting on the Panda backstory, speaking of which. Do they understand him? <laughs> I'm not sure if Fabrice is really enough to cover it. I think I like these end credit scenes more than the, the Demon Slayer Taisho secrets. It just gives you a, a little taste of that slice of life goodness to end the episode.